Good evening, and very special Halloween greetings from the East Coast. This evening, it is my delight to be able to share with you one of my favorite tales, and what may very well be the oldest ghost story on record for the city of St. John's. It dates back to the year 1745, and it involves a man by the name of Samuel Pettyham. Samuel Pettyham rented a small house on a dark lane which led off Queen's Road. At that point, Queen's Road was at the very edge of the seaport town. Pettyham acquired the services of a housekeeper, a woman from the area who would come in during the day to cook and clean, but who refused to spend a night in the dwelling house. She expressed her concerns about Pettyham remaining alone in the building, but he dismissed her worries. One night, shortly after the time of his arrival in the building, Pettyham was reading by lamplight in the kitchen, and just as he was about to close his book and turn in, he thought he heard the click of a door latch. And looking up, he saw the latch to the back door rise into the air, hesitate for a moment, and then sink back down into place. Now, the bolts to the door were shut, and so the door did not open, but fearing burglars, and remembering that the front of his house was unlocked, Pettyham raced to the front of the home and slammed home the bolts. No sooner had he done so than that latch, too, began to rise into the air, hesitate for a moment, and then slowly sink back down into place. At this, Pettyham was determined to see who was responsible. He quietly slipped back the bolts. He then threw the door open wide, but there was no one there. At first, Pettyham was suspicious that it was the actions of local youngsters out to frighten him, but as the weeks wore on, the same lifting and lowering was repeated always without any sign of a human culprit. And as the weeks wore on, about a month or so after, Pettyham had all the proof he needed that the lifting and lowering of latches had an altogether unearthly origin. As the legend is told, Pettyham had been attending a dinner party in the west end of St. John's, and as it was late, his host offered to drive him home, hitching up his horse and carriage. The horse drove up what is now New Gower Street and turned onto Queen's Road. And as the beast drew abreast of the little laneway that led to Pettyham's house, it stopped and refused to budge an inch further forward, even when it felt the sting of its owner's whip. At this, Pettyham volunteered to walk the rest of the distance. The laneway was dark and overgrown with trees, but ahead of him, Pettyham could see a glowing light, and thinking it to be a lamp, or a lantern of some sort carried by a fellow human being, he quickened his step to catch up with the figure responsible. About twenty yards further on, a figure stepped into the moonlit clearing immediately in front of Pettyham's cabin. The figure stood still for a moment and then slowly turned to face Pettyham. Pettyham took one look at the vision and turned and fled in absolute horror. For the figure he had seen was that of a man, a tall man, a man with his head cut completely off just above the shoulders. Pettyham raced back along Queen's Road. He burst into a boarding house and he begged for shelter for the evening. And after he calmed down, he gave a clear version of the night's events and was told a most miraculous tale. It seems the headless ghost that Pettyham had witnessed was the spectre of a well-known captain who had plied his trade between England and Newfoundland. While the captain was in St. John's, it was said that he was the companion of a beautiful lady, a lady who dwelt in the very same house now occupied by Pettyham. When the captain was in St. John's, the two were inseparable. However, while the captain was away at sea, the lady showered her affections on a local man. And this second man, jealous 
of the attentions paid to the captain was determined to do away with his competition. And late one night, just after the captain had said good night to his lady and had stepped back onto the narrow pathway, the jealous lover leapt forward and with an exceptionally sharp sword severed the captain's head from his body just above the shoulders. The culprit was never brought to justice, although all signs of guilt seemed to point in his direction. And the soul of the captain, it is rumored, still haunts the sight of his grisly decapitation, forever in search of his unpunished murderer. From the foggy shores of Newfoundland, I wish you a happy Halloween. I'm storyteller Dale Jarvis. What do you do when the world starts calling your name? What do you do when everybody's feeling the same? What can you do when you want to shake it up?
Have you ever felt like you were navigating life without a compass? Like there were no solid bearings, only vague signposts? Well, I spent most of my teens and 20s in that state, a state that I can only describe as limbo. And then, one night in my early 20s, I was watching Apocalypse Now. Marlon Brando, the central character toward the end of the film, has a line. He says, if everything around you were in doubt, could you still trust yourself? I shut off the movie and in that moment, I wasn't watching a movie anymore. I was having an existential thought process bigger than anything that I've, I had ever had in my years of therapy. Now, many people have written about these states of limbo, this dark night of the soul. Dante called it La Selva Oscura. St. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. And my psychologist called it major, major depressive disorder. So somewhere in my mid to late 20s, I started ice climbing and climbing became what I held on to through this limbo that I was living through. But climbing helped me trust myself. I trust, trusted my partner, I trusted the ice, I trusted the rock, but it taught me how to trust myself. But one event stands out more than any other that taught me how to trust. My partner Grant and I drove up the Icefields Parkway one night because a climb had formed, an ice climb had formed called Ice Nine, halfway up the Icefields Parkway. And we wanted to climb it, it rarely formed. We camped on the side of the highway we got up in the morning early and had breakfast and coffee and we parked on the side of the road at the base of Ice Nine and we started hiking in. About 10 minutes into our hike, I felt this overwhelming sense of fear and I turned back and looked at my partner and said, I feel like if I go up to this climb today, I'm going to die. My partner said, that's fine, let's go back to Canmore. So we drove back to Canmore and we started doing our errands for the day, grocery shopping, about two in the afternoon, we ended up at the liquor store, and on our way in, a climber friend was exiting the store, Louis Julien. And he said, hey, did you guys hear what happened at Ice Nine this morning? Grant and I looked at each other and said, no. He said a woman was blaying at the base when 40 tons of ice dislodged above her and crushed her and killed her. Grant and I looked at each other with wide eyes. In that moment, I knew that trusting my instincts had saved my life. I also felt that there were spirits in the mountains that must be helping us keep out of danger and stay alive. And the trick to navigating life is listening to that internal navigating system that we all have, as well as the voices of the spirits that are all around us. Come riding up one dark and windy day. Pony Hill, he rested as he went along his way. And all at once, a mighty herd of red eyed cows he saw plowing through the ragged sky. In the cloudy draw. Gather round, no fear, no fear. When the ghosts crowd around, no fear, no fear. Down in the underground, no fear, no fear. In the city, in the town. Happy. Feel 
through the woods to make sure it was still there, that it hadn't been a figment of my imagination, a trick of the eyes in the half-light. But there, among the grey-brown tree trunks and rocks, was the unmistakable shape of a human structure. What was it, I wondered? Whatever it was had been there a long time, the walls faded and weathered to the same hues of the forest. There was no way in from our yard that I could see. No path through the underbrush or the road or the neighbors on the far side, although cats periodically appeared in our yard from that direction, slipping past the ferns and mushrooms and fallen branches. The only way in that I could see was from the bay. I busied myself until low tide, then double-checked my watch to make sure I still had time before school pickup. I would only be gone half an hour, an hour at most, I reasoned. My rain boots clomped over the still glistening grass, seaweed, and pebbles as I picked my way through the yard, over the beach, to the edge of the wooded lot. I stood for a moment, hands in pockets against the chill, considering my entry points. It would be a tight squeeze. I scrabbled up the embankment to the tree line. A crow took wing with an explosion of flapping and cawing, and I screeched in surprise. Then I laughed at myself and the situation. What on earth was I doing? A nearly middle-aged mother mucking about in my wellies after what? We might want to buy the land to stop someone building next door, I rationalized, so I might as well see what was there. But really, I just wanted to know. What could possibly be there contained in the overgrown forest? I approached the most likely place to fight my way in, 
The fat-bottomed orb weavers had been busy, sitting in wait for autumn flies and wasps. I shuddered at the thought of walking face-first through those webs, the sticky tendrils wrapping across my eyes and nose and mouth. I should just go home, I thought, but I caught sight of the roof line of the structure and grabbed a stick to brush away the webs in front of me, apologizing to the hard-working spiders. I kept sweeping away the webs as I picked my way in deeper and deeper, hyper aware of every movement and sound around me. The chainsaw roars, the blue jay screams, the red squirrel warnings. I pressed on. The structure materialized in greater detail as I approached. Small windows, a door, a wood stove chimney. It was a compact cabin. I moved toward it and the light shifted. It was like clouds had passed in front of the sun, except that was impossible with the weather being so overcast. The birds and animals went silent, and I couldn't hear the chainsaw from next door any longer. It wasn't just quiet, I realized with a shiver. It was the total absence of sound. I grabbed for my phone, my tether to reality, to humanity, to help, but it was gone from my pocket. Had I dropped it? I searched the ground at my feet and backwards along the route I had taken, but there was nothing. And, I realized with growing dread, no hint of the path I'd taken from the bay. I slowly turned a circle, convinced if I just looked hard enough from every angle, I could find my way again. I felt panic bubbling up, the growing knowledge that I had made a terrible mistake. And beyond the fear, despair. I realized with a jolt that it wasn't mine. It was coming from the cabin. It was the feeling of depression that sucks the air and light and energy from the room. It muffles laughter and strips smiles. I had lived in that room, been trapped in that bottle, with no idea how I'd gotten in or how I'd ever get out. Even though it was the last thing I wanted to do, even though my inside screamed at me to run far away or dig myself a hole or climb a tree, anything but this, I walked toward the cabin. One step, two, slow, deliberate steps, my senses alert, then the sound, a creaking, a, a rocking, the unmistakable sound of a rocking chair on hardwood floor, back and forth, back and forth. The grimy windows didn't reveal much of the inside of the cabin, but it wasn't dark inside, that I could tell. Standing on the doorstep now, I saw a wood stove alive with flames, a tidy space, sparse furnishings, and a rocking chair in motion, with someone sitting in it. Forêt's berceuse came from a record player in the corner, light and airy and yearning. The waves of sadness carried through the doorway along with the music so that I felt less scared than worried, and not for myself, but for whoever was in the chair. The woman's light brown hair was wavy and just brushed the base of her neck. She wore a kimono, or at least a dressing gown in a Japanese style. She held something in her lap, a bundle of cloth. A baby-sized bundle I knew somehow, my stomach clenching, my hand caressed my belly instinctively, remembering when I was huge with Lucas. Bile rose in my throat. Lucas. God, I hoped I'd get back to him. He was mean, you know, the woman was talking to me, I realized. I guess my boy could have turned out mean. She raised her eyes to me. They were pale gray-blue, hollow and sad. But I was going to try and make him sweet. The woman stroked the bundle, and I could see the cloth was soaked through now, dark and ominous. I looked around the room, the stove and fridge bright yellow, the record player still spinning, foré, while the fire threw shadows across the faded floral wallpaper, the smell of wood fire and something else. He wouldn't take me to the hospital, wouldn't get the midwife or even a neighbor. The woman raised the tiny bundle to her chest, patting what I assumed was an infant's back, even though he's the one that did this. 
I watched with fascinated horror as she peeled back the baby blanket and kissed the top of her dead son's head. My mouth was dry, my throat tight. He shouldn't have hurt you, I choked out. She continued rocking, nuzzling the baby's head, her eyes closed. The grief poured off her into the room, mingling with the wood smoke. The grief and the guilt and the fear. And a smell I hadn't been able to place before. The faint whiff of bleach. I should have gone away. I knew what he was like. And now I saw the one bundle had become three. Her arms almost overflowed with them. Still, she rocked. My insides twisted tighter and tears pricked my eyes. I thought of Lucas. Children forgive their parents. I don't know why, but they do. Her eyes found mine. You're a mother. It was a statement. Yes, a boy. He's seven. I thought of Lucas's dark brown curls bobbing down the steps of the bus, him rushing to me full of stories from his day, his hand finding mine on the walk down the hill. Is he sweet? Usually, I squeaked out, a sob catching in my throat, wanting more than anything to be with him. Good, good. She held on tight to her bundles and rocked make sure he stays that way. The woman, the chair, the music, everything flickered like an old movie reel, then went gray and silent. The distant roar of the chainsaw and animal sounds rushed back, and the forest light came into focus again. Glancing backward as I ran toward the freedom of broken spiderwebs and branches, I saw the cabin was empty again, except for dust and crawling things, and a single rocking chair.
Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more. "'Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, "'but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, "'and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, "'that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore! Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy chest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he muttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, 
said I. What it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee. By these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet! Said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether temper sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <laughs> Are the women breathing death in the mirror? 
bills Overpaying it is a day You're a child's right to play The gunshots rain down from the hills Strikers, militias, wobblies and priests They all scratch their names in my walls And now the blood turns to dust When we bury the past No more stories when the last hotel falls I am the voice in the floorboards I am the smoke in the walls I am the ghost of an old lonely building In my time, I swear I've seen it all And now I wait for the big wrecking ball Fall like leaves in the branches of time My walls shake with the songs of the dead And the stories ring out like an old sailor's rhyme When I'm gone, there'll be silence instead So take the plugs from your ears, put your head to the floor Trade your plastic for leather and steel Listen for the voices of the ones who came before They're still there if you know how to feel I am the voice in the floorboards I am the smoke in the walls And I am the ghost of an old lonely building In my time, I swear I've seen it all And now I wait for the big wrecking ball Soldiers leave nothing but stories to tell In their graves I can still hear them turn Silence is gold for the ones at the top They bury the living memory But now the gravedigger's hands can make the great machine stop Take the shovel and set yourself free And I am the voice in the floorboards I am the smoke in the walls And I am the ghost of an old lonely building In my time, I swear I've seen it all And now I wait for the big wrecking ball Thomas Ritter gripped the reins, slowing his horse as he surveyed the mountain range on the horizon. Against the vast Alberta sky, the Rockies were a faint memory. His past belonged in the range's treacherous passes, where he oversaw the construction of the railroad tunnels. His future was firmly rooted in the ranch he had purchased from his earnings. Ritter owned a luxurious home several acres of land, and enough cattle to enjoy a comfortable life. A pair of fawns loped across the field toward a gully near the edge of his property. Decades of overflooding from the nearby river had carved the ravine out, leaving watering holes for the deer and other animals in the area. 
Ritter snapped the reins of his horse and rode toward the gully, scaring off the fawns. He stared at a mound of stones halfway down the ravine. Under that pile, his present and his past converged, but he was not ready to confront it. Not today. He wheeled his steed around and rode back up the hill. He needed to put some distance between his past and present. The cattle grazing on the slopes barely stirred as he whipped past them. The terrain leveled off as he neared his ranch. The roof peaks over the second floor windows were the turrets of what Ritter's wife called their cowboy castle. Lizzie and Mabel were playing on the veranda of the spacious home. Mabel heard their father's approach and practically vaulted off the porch to greet him. Her older sister, Lizzie, collected the dolls and placed them on the bench. Lizzie was the responsible one, taking after her father, never one to leave things undone. Daddy, Mabel yelled as she pawed at Ritter's stirrup. I want to go for a ride. Take me. <laughs> Give me your hand, sweetie. She reached up and he took her arm, lifting her onto the back of his horse. She gripped his waist and squealed with delight. He rode to the barn to put away the horse. Then he hoisted his daughter onto his shoulders and carried her into the house. Let's see what your mother has made for dinner, shall we? It's steak and beans. I helped. I'm sure it will be delicious, Mabel. Food was the last thing on Ritter's mind. At the dinner table, he absently pushed the food around his plate. For goodness sake, his wife said, I swear you're worse than the girls. If you don't like what I cooked, just tell me. Ritter looked up. Sorry, Clara. It's good. I'm just not hungry. I'll eat it later. What's gotten into you, Thomas? Nothing. Lost in my thoughts, I suppose. Would you like to unburden yourself? He forced a smile at his daughter's. No, you need to get these darlings to bed and uh, I have to catch up on some reading. Clara raised an eyebrow as she took her husband's plate. You? Reading? That's a first. He rubbed Lizzie's blonde hair and kissed Mabel on the cheek. You two get to bed now. Yes, father, Lizzie said. I'm not sleepy, Mabel whined. Now, Clara barked. Now, the girl scattered from the kitchen. It was clear who ruled the house. Clara, I'll be in the study. Just need a bit of time to clear my head. All right, Thomas. Ritter headed down the hallway to the study, where he nestled into his wing-back chair. Casting an orange glow across the room, the fireplace crackled a few feet away. Ritter fished out a letter from his vest pocket, unfolded the paper, and poured over the contents of the missive. Dear Mr. Ritter, I'm corresponding with you on behalf of Lu Sha Kim, a Chinese priest who has come to Canada in search of the remains of Ji Wan Shi. According to Mr. Liu, this man was a laborer in your employ during the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway line through the Rocky Mountains. It is our understanding that you were responsible for the burial arrangements of Ji Wan Shi and may know the whereabouts of his grave. We would like to speak to you about the location of his remains, as per Chinese custom, his bones must be exhumed and returned to his village in China. Mr. Kim is prepared to pay a small sum in exchange for your information. Kindly respond to me at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, Robert Denton, Barrister. Ritter leaned back in his chair, reviewing the letter. The lantern flame danced from a draft in the room. Ritter glanced around, looking for what disturbed the air. Nothing. A crack. Was it a log not popping in the fireplace? No. Ritter had heard this sound before. The crack of rock from a pick being driven into it. He placed the letter on the end table, stood up, 
and paced around the room in search of the source of the noise. A movement from outside the window. For a second, Ritter saw a dirty face in the glass. Was someone there? He peered closer. No sign of anyone. <gasps> he spun around, his fists clenched and ready for battle. Thomas? Clara stood in the doorway. What has gotten into you? Ritter lowered his fists. Sorry, I guess I'm on edge. She picked up the letter. What's this? Uh, nothing to concern you, he said. She ignored him and skimmed the contents. What is, what is this about? They want to they wanna dig up a body? It's nonsense. Pay it no mind. Do we even know this man they're talking about? It's some kind of misunderstanding. I wouldn't be able to tell one of those laborers from another. They all looked alike to me. Why would this priest think you arranged the funeral then? I'm not entirely sure, Clara. A lot of workers came and went on that project. I'm sure the priest got some wrong information. Well, it seems serious enough that he'd pay money to find the body. There's nothing I can do to help him. He took the letter from his wife. Clara, it's nothing to worry about. Are you certain? He smiled. Put it out of your mind. He walked to the fireplace and tossed the letter into the flames. He watched as the fire consumed the paper, sending tendrils of smoke up the flume. It's morbid if you ask me. Digging up bodies? Who would do that? Ritter kissed his wife on the cheek. Go on, Clara. I'll come to bed shortly. Don't stay up too late, she said. I'll be right behind you. Clara left the den. Silence descended on the room like a sheet over a corpse. Ritter stared at the letter turning to ash, his gaze fixated on the last of the message burning up. If only his past were as easy to erase. so much that I actually have an entire album of murder ballads. I like to think of them as songs of reckoning. One of the songs off this record was actually inspired by the Cecil Hotel in Calgary.
drawn a fool line Try to find some kind of work if I can I live among the shadows No beauty for the damned I spend my days along Life of a wanted man Or I go to sleep at night Pray the devil don't grind me dead Say Christopher What's a true story, you ask? Let me tell you. As I have been asked here tonight to share a story, something chilling, something thrilling, something true, something that almost disappeared for a whole community that I hold dear. And I know you do as well. So let me tell you now the story that happened in the year 2020. Ugh. 2020. Let me read it to you now. Truth is, almost every artist in Canada had a show cancellation or even a season cancellation from theater to music festivals, the music almost, almost died. And many venues were silenced, except for the sound of perhaps some ghosts in the floorboards. Did you hear that, Norbert? Did you hear it? We must go on. Thankfully, we can celebrate the artists through programs like this. Bravo to all on today's show who have given of their time and art to the Habitat for the Arts in Jasper, Alberta. And bravo to you who have supported this program by purchasing tickets. When the doors closed at Habitat on March 13th, Friday the 13th, the canceled signs went up on a year's program of workshops, including a book fair and the Jasper Fringe Festival, the annual year end of art exhibition now. And numerous music, theater, and live events. From a space that once echoed with laughter and applause, the silence now competes with the time before programming, before we drag tables and chairs together, before we set up ladders and lights. Pivot, they said. The arts wrote the book on pivot. This is only the beginning of where Habitat can be found, still supporting artists and bringing entertainment to the community, still offering you ways to engage in all things art. So goodbye for now. We shall meet again on December 26th for our annual dinner theater 
and variety show. With no dinner, of course. In closing, you should know words are spells. So I spin this spell to you. It is art that makes life, makes interest, makes importance. And I know of no substitute, whatever, for the force and beauty of its process. Thank you for listening to our story and continuing to support the arts. Have a happy Halloween and may 2020 get better. <laughs>